All right, good morning. Hello and welcome to today's Wyoming Community Navigator Program webinar. We are so thankful that you have joined us today. My name is Mandy Bailey and I am the Advising and Education Director for the Wyoming Community Navigator Program. I'm going to be your facilitator today working behind the scenes to assist as best I can with any technical difficulties, questions, or anything else that comes up. Just to give you a little bit of background, uh, we are going to monitor the chat and we are going to be posting helpful links and information. Feel free to drop your questions in the chat or the Q&A. Unmute yourself, turn on your camera if you want to do any of that. Uh, the Wyoming Community Navigator Program is funded through the U.S. Small Business Administration, and it utilizes the Wyoming Entrepreneurial Support Network to reduce barriers that all small businesses often face including those owned by groups such as veteran, women, and those from rural communities and communities of color. The Wyoming Community Navigator Program uses a hub and spoke model to pursue its goals. Through the collective efforts, the hub and spoke provide training, access to capital, and access to other resources to help small business owners build resiliency and ultimately be the driving force behind Wyoming's economic recovery. So today's presentation is choosing the right e-commerce platform for your business with Bridget Manley and Daniel Patterson. Bridget is an e-learning specialist with a passion for helping learners become effective agents in their careers and in their communities. She co-founded Ascendant Design and Training with her husband, Daniel, in July of 2020. Before that, she was the curriculum manager for a Denver-based startup company, where she developed compliance and manufacturing training for the state legal cannabis industry. Bridget draws from a range of learning theories and instructional design models to create courses that are precision built to solve real world problems. And Daniel Patterson is a software systems developer with over 30 years of multidisciplinary experience in software, electronic and medical design, oh, not medical, sorry, mechanical design. <laughs> He has been involved in several different industries, including logistics, gaming, music, and heavy equipment, just to name a few. And in those industries, Daniel has managed projects large and small and has over re overseen research, development, engineering, and IT departments. And he's managed the implementation and upkeep of automated production systems. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Bridget and Daniel. Okay, well, thank you, Mandy. I appreciate uh, that wonderful introduction. Um, hopefully you should be able to uh, see my screen. Um, if you can't see it or if there's any problems throughout the webinar, um, feel free to just drop that in the chat and uh, let us know if you need anything. Um, so today uh, we're excited to talk to you about choosing the right e-commerce platform for your business. Um, we know that e-commerce is, is really a big concern for a lot of uh, businesses, and it presents a huge opportunity to expand your business and to reach new customers. But of course, there's lots of technical considerations to take into account when you're thinking of either launching or expanding your online business. So today we're going to give you some tips and some uh, information that will hopefully make it easier for you to find the solution that best aligns with your goals. Just a little bit more um, about us. Um, I'm Bridget Manley. Um, I'm the Chief Learning Officer here at Ascendant Design and Training. And like most small business owners, I do wear a lot of hats. Um, the main one would be a learning experience designer. So I help uh, clients, mostly companies, develop custom e-learning solutions for uh, their employees so that their people can do their jobs better. Um, Daniel um, is my uh, business partner and my spouse. Um, he's our chief technical officer, and he's kind of the head of the product side of the house. Um, so he's um, in charge of developing technical tools, techniques, and procedures. Um, I'm kind of more the services side of the business where I work directly with clients to provide them with services to help with employee training. So let's go over just a little bit about uh, what we'll do today in this session. Um, we're going to start by identifying the four key elements of an e-commerce platform or an e-commerce system. It's probably the better way to put it. Um, just the four components you need to make sure that your e-commerce business works smoothly online. Um, from there, we'll identify some key considerations to take into account when you're evaluating each different component so you can find the one that works best for you. And then at the end of the webinar, we'll kind of put it all together by comparing three popular e-commerce platforms 
based on those four different elements. So uh, the end of the webinar, I think, is probably will get a lot of value just being able to see how those four elements integrate um, into some of the three most common um, e-commerce platforms we have out there today. Um, throughout the webinar, um, you're more than welcome to interact with us and interact with other attendees. Um, feel free to drop questions or thoughts in the chat. Um, we'll pause throughout the webinar to um, answer questions or elicit feedback or you know, any questions you might have. During those pauses, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question if you're comfortable with that. Uh, we just ask that when you're not speaking to go ahead and leave your microphone muted just so we don't have any background noise. So with that, we're going to jump straight into a question. Uh, we'd like to know a little bit more about you, um, what type of e-commerce business you own or hope to own uh, if you don't have one launched already, and um, a little bit about what specifically you hope to learn today. We'd like to know what brings you here today so we can, uh, if possible, modify the presentation a little bit to um, address the specific concerns that you have. Um, so I'm just going to pause just for a couple uh, seconds here, give you a chance to respond to that. Um, and yeah, just a minute to think about that. I'm going to keep an eye on the chat here. Okay. Um, so Cindy, uh, let's see, retail consignment model and online auction. That's an interesting model. Okay. Uh, Jennifer, I'm a filmmaker, so selling screening kits, digital delivery. Cool. Um, Roberta, dragonfly planners, digital planner business. Ooh, I love planners. They're, they're, they're my favorite. That's awesome. It's super cool. Um, okay, Selena says we currently use Square. Yep, that's, that's definitely, um, that's a component in the payment processing um, model that we'll talk about in just a little bit. Um, Selena also says, uh, Teton Raptor Center, small nonprofit. We use Square for e-commerce and in-store. Okay, excellent. Cool. And then she also says, we are expanding our operations and are considering switching uh, point of sales, but we'll likely stick with Square. Okay. Uh, Nicole, Kraft Sausage and Gourmet Ice Cream Companies. Wow, what an interesting combination. Uh, it sounds great though, now that I think about it. And now I'm hungry for both sausage and ice cream. Uh, Melissa, artist and herbalist. Uh, Nicole. Okay. Yep. Sausage and ice cream, of course. Okay. Excellent. All right. Cool. Um, so uh, thank you for participating actively today. Again, feel free to jump in the chat, share your thoughts, uh, feel free to respond to other people's thoughts. We kind of want this to be more of a conversation rather than us just lecturing you for 45 minutes. So hopefully um, this will be valuable to you and you'll be able to have um, you know, some good connections today. So with that, we're going to um, head into the first part of today's webinar, which is uh, we'll be, you know, looking at the anatomy of an e-commerce system based on those four components. And those four components are the catalog, the shopping cart, the payment processing component, and fulfillment. So the catalog, this is where um, customers can find the products or services that you provide. And kind of the key question to consider here is whether or not customers can easily find what they want from your online store. So this is where presentation and organization is really key for your online business is in that catalog component. The second component is the shopping cart. So once they know what they want to buy, um, how easy is it for them to uh, choose what they want to purchase and start initiating that purchasing transaction? Now, a lot of times, um, as you're probably familiar with, uh, shopping cart will have uh, features like the add to cart button, and the checkout button. Um, it might have some other features too, but those are the two core uh, customer facing um, elements that your shopping cart will have. The third component is the payment processing component. We kind of mentioned this just a second ago, but this, is, um, uh, this allows your customers to make their purchases online both easily and securely. Um, Payment can be a little bit tricky just because there are many different ways that customers can pay for their purchases. And we'll go over that um, when we um, address the payment processing section. But just to keep in mind that um, there are a lot of different ways that um, you know, customers might be wanting to pay for their purchases and your payment processor um, will help you determine what kind of payment you can accept. And then the final component is fulfillment. And this probably relates more so to products rather than services. 
but this is uh, based on whether or not your customers can easily receive their purchases in a timely manner. So together, all these four components make up a um, basic e-commerce system. Now, important thing to keep in mind is that not all e-commerce platforms will include all these four components. Some of them may have the catalog, the shopping cart, and the payment processing, but they may not have a lot of support for shipping and fulfillment. Or they might just have a catalog and a shopping cart and no payment processing. So um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, there are lots of different options to look at, but when you're looking at these options, it's, it's important to consider these four components. And if, um, if the platform doesn't include one of these, uh, you'll be looking at some sort of third-party integration that fits into your website to provide that. Okay, so let's dive right in and um, start with catalog considerations. So for all four of these components, we'll look at some questions you wanna ask yourself to identify um, what would be the best solution for you. Now, of course, uh, your catalog will vary depending on whether you're selling products or services. So um, here are some questions to ask if you are going to be selling products. The first thing you wanna ask is what kind of products are you selling? Are they standalone products, add-on products, or do they have variable product options? Now by add-on products, um, that just means if your product is supplementing something that the customer already has. So for instance, maybe you're a software developer and your job is to create uh, plugins like we just mentioned a second ago. And these are um, software components that integrate or plug in to an existing piece of software. So by itself, it doesn't have a lot of value but it does have value when you combine it with another platform. That's an example of an add-on product. Um, when we're talking about variable product options, a good example of that would be, say, you're selling T-shirts, and you have, uh, for each design, you have different colors and different sizes. Now, this is where your catalog can really help your business uh, streamline, um, because if your catalog allows you to set those variable options for multiple products, you don't have to go in for each individual product and manually lay out how many sizes are available, how many colors are available. It saves you quite a bit of time. Now, if you're selling services, your, your catalog might look very different. It might actually look more like a scheduling service. So you might want to consider whether or not it offers some sort of appointment management. Because when you're selling services, there's a good chance you'll be selling, at least part of that time, will be selling your time. Um, some e-commerce platforms include uh, appointment management systems that allow you to um, let, let, let customers choose when they want to meet with you. And in some cases, it will uh, integrate among multiple service members. So if you have more than one person in your company, it will manage all those schedules and make sure that no one gets double booked or something like that. Um, another thing you might want to consider if you're selling services is whether or not um, it, whether or not the catalog supports providing estimated wait times. So if you have a first come first first serve kind of service, you want to make sure that. There's some way for customers to know how long it might take for them to get the next available slot. Um, another handy feature too is automatic reminders. And this is when um, a customer schedules an appointment, you can set it up to where your system will actually send them a, you know, some kind of reminder, usually email or in text to remind them that their appointment is coming up. And this can really reduce no-shows um, in some cases, it can also send a reminder to you as a service provider to make sure that you don't accidentally drop an appointment, which is really helpful. Um, so, these are some, so these are some questions you want to ask yourself when you're looking at, um, you know, what kind of catalog is going to be best for you. The main question will probably be whether you're selling products, whether you're selling services, or maybe you're selling a combination of both. In that case, you might be looking for you know, a more robust catalog that can, uh, that can support both of those. So the next thing you wanna consider is your shopping cart. And this part is really important because the shopping cart component uh, really determines whether or not your customers have a smooth and seamless shopping experience, which by extension will determine how successful to some degree your e-commerce business is. So here are some questions you wanna ask yourself. The first one is whether or not the shopping cart in your e-commerce system is intuitive and easy to use. It should be very easy for customers to find the, uh, you know, um, you know, move, uh, excuse me, the buy now button um, or the checkout button. 
um, it shouldn't be hard for them to be able to add things to their cart or start the transaction. Um, another thing to consider is whether or not the shopping cart interrupts the page. Um, you want it to be easy to find, but at the same time, you don't want it to take up the whole screen or uh, make it hard for customers to go back to the page that they were on to continue browsing. Um, you want to really consider kind of the user experience when they're using it and make sure that it's not going to disrupt that shopping experience too much. Another handy feature that you might want to consider is a shopping cart that allows customers to make purchases from anywhere on your site. And this is handy because you can nudge customers to make purchases at key decision points. So for instance, let's say, um, let's say you make custom jewelry and you have a blog post about uh, latest trends in jewelry in 2023. You can integrate, um, you know, say like a small sampling of your most current designs right in that blog post. So that way customers can buy straight from the blog post. They're already thinking about latest designs, right? So you just kind of give them a little nudge to go ahead and make the purchase now while they're thinking about it. And this is really handy because you can put those sales uh, calls to actions anywhere on your website where it makes sense, where they are gonna be making um, decisions. So it increases the likelihood that you'll make a sale. Another thing you wanna consider with your shopping cart is whether or not customers have to leave your site to complete the purchase. Now, in some cases, uh, especially if you're using some sort of third-party integration, that just might be part of the experience. Maybe you can't get around that. Um, but whenever possible, you want to try to at least give the appearance or the feeling uh, that customers aren't being taken away to a different place or it's not too disruptive. Whenever possible, you do want to keep the shopping cart on your site and integrated in your site. So it's one easy experience. Okay. So uh, before we go into um, uh, payment processing, I just want to pause and see if there are any questions or any thoughts so far. Feel free to drop them in the chat or unmute your microphone. Okay. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and we'll go to payment processing considerations. Bridget, we actually do have one question. It just came through. Oh, sure. On sales of digital products, is there a tax? That's a good question. Um, Daniel, do you have any insight on that? Um, I think my uh, recommendation on that would be uh, that would be handled by your payment processor. And so it really depends on who your payment processor is and, and what level of service that they can provide, so. So like with city, I mean, I'm sure it probably varies by different, you know, like municipality and stuff, but like just um, like, like federally or statewide, is there typically a tax on those kinds of products? Yeah, most of these uh, processors are responsible to collect sales tax for whatever state um, in which the purchaser uh, lived. Okay, okay, gotcha. So they're kind of responsible for making sure that um, in whatever jurisdiction you're in, that they're collecting the correct sales tax for that. Right, so if you live in Wyoming and there's a sales tax in Wyoming, that payment processor should collect the sales tax uh, for Wyoming on that particular transaction. And then... Um, well, it, it really also depends on who actually sends that money to, because a lot of times the, the vendor, which would be you in this case, uh, would still have to, to uh, send that money to the state. <laughs> so, um, right. but in some cases, the payment processors actually uh, will pay the state uh, those particular sales taxes collected. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. And then uh, the other question on sales of digital products is their tax. And uh, I believe that in most cases these days, uh, digital things like, uh, for example, a, a software uh, program or um, let's say the latest uh, pop album or something like that uh, delivered digitally, I think all of those are considered as taxable items. Okay, excellent. Excellent. So um, in, in this yeah. case, 
um, I think we're talking about downloads. And so would that still be the same, Daniel? Yeah, mostly, uh, um, typically, like, let's say if you if you purchase the new like MP3 version of of a pop album or something, you would still be charged as having purchased that album. Um, in a lot of cases, there is the option that you can also get a physical version of it. But, uh, you know, even though it's going to be downloaded, it's a product. OK, excellent. Excellent. Does that kind of uh, um, uh, answer the question? based on what you know, Mandy? I believe so, yes. Okay, okay. We have another question, it says good enough. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you, thank you, appreciate that. Okay, excellent. All right, well, that's a great segue to talking about payment processing. So um, with that, questions you want to ask, of course, is you know whether or not your payment processor will, um, you know, uh, collect the correct tax for you. I'm glad that came up because it is an important consideration when you're looking at um, this particular part of your system. Some other things you want to ask are what types of payment can it accept? Typically, you want to have your payment processor at the very least accept all major credit cards. And that's because one, most people use credit cards when they're, or debit cards, kind of the same thing. Um, you know, people use those primarily when they're shopping online. And secondly, um, credit card processors uh, are held to a very high level of, of, of responsibility and high standards in terms of safety um, and security. So that's probably one of the more secure ways that you can collect payment. But you can also collect payment in other ways. For example, like digital wallets, Apple Pay or Google Pay, um, or what, um, or like uh, members, members only money sharing system. So like PayPal, for instance or Venmo or Zelle, some of those other money sharing systems. Your customers might be using all of those or a combination. Um, so this is where it's really helpful, uh, you know, if you do have kind of an understanding of, of who, your, who your clientele is, to consider what kind of payment that they will be using to purchase from you. But again, at the very least, to make sure that it will process major credit cards. Um, kind of in line with that, you want to make sure that the service can securely handle electronic transfers. Now, again, with credit card processors, that's not really much of an issue. But if you're using something like um, Zelle or Venmo or something that's maybe just on the market new and you don't know much about it, it's a good idea to do a little bit of research and just make sure that they're uh, reputable and that they're uh, safe and have a good track record. Um, you also, again, want to make sure, uh, if possible, that the payment processing doesn't take customers to another site, if possible. Again, you want to keep all of that contained onto your own website. And you also want to consider what's the price for the service and who pays for it. Um, now, a lot of times, um, any type of payment processing will, will, um, will include some kind of a fee uh, or some kind of a charge. Um, in most cases, the vendor will pay those fees, but in some cases, the customer will pay too. And we'll look at an instance and when that will happen in just a second. But for right now, it's important to know that the amount of fees you pay on your payment processor will determine or will be dependent largely on whether or not you're considered to be operating in a low risk or high risk industry. So what does that mean? Well, low risk and high risk in this context is just basically describes how banks rate different types of business categories. And these are usually determined by um, how many um, challenge challenged transactions occur in an industry. Um, so if you have a specific business line where there's a higher level of challenged um, payments or there's a um, you know, greater number of chargebacks, then those are ranked as uh, high risk businesses. And again, this has nothing really a statement on, you know, the business owner's level of responsibility. It's just how the banks perceive the industry that you're operating in. So here are some examples of some high-risk businesses. Um, CBD-based products, uh, educational seminars. Um, if you're doing any kind of future delivery where customers are getting their products more than 90 days out, that's considered to be in a high-risk category. Um, import and export um, search engine options optimization or SEO and tech support. Um, now you should have a copy of the uh, slide deck um, 
um, and if not, we can send one to you afterwards. But on slide 25, on the very end of this webinar, we have a full list of all of the high-risk categories. So you can see if your particular business falls into one of those. But for right now, just suffice it to say, if you are in a high-risk category, that doesn't mean that you can't do e-commerce. You definitely can. You just will probably have to invest a little bit more time and energy in finding uh, a credit card processor who will give you a good deal. Um, um, now, um, if you do have um, a business bank account, it might be a good idea to approach your local bank and see what they can do for you. In some cases, your local bank might be able to process your credit card transactions. And in that case, they can take into account your personal history with them and maybe give you a little bit more of a uh, better deal in terms of uh, processing your payments for you. Okay, so with that, let's look at uh, the price kind of, you know, or just kind of a general breakdown of, of what prices you might be expected to pay on payment processing based on different categories. Uh, so we have a table on the slide right now uh, that kind of breaks it down by um, the type of plan that you have, the type of business you have, uh, your monthly service charge, the percent of the transaction paid by the seller for each uh, transaction, and the percentage of the transaction paid by the customer. So, um, 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 if you're operating in a low risk business category, then you can usually expect to uh, pay a lower monthly service charge and have a low percentage of transaction that you have to pay for each uh, sale you make. Uh, if you're in a high risk business, then you can expect to pay a little bit more in your monthly service charge and pay a medium percentage of um, each purchase. Um, if you're using um, a digital wallet like Apple Pay or Google Pay, there's usually not a monthly service charge, but there will be a medium uh, percentage of transaction that you will pay. Um, the payment processing that's hosted, say, on a uh, platform. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just seeing a I'm just seeing a comment. Um, can you reduce the slide size? Can't see the left hand columns. OK. Um, oops, excuse me. I don't think I can reduce reduce the slide size. Um, Cindy, um, can you maybe resize your, um, like maybe uh, resize your browser window? Yeah, I think it's on my end, sorry, thank you. No, that's okay, no problem. Okay. Um, so if you're using um, some sort of uh, payment processing that's hosted by your e-commerce platform, um, the amount of, um, the amount that you'll pay in a monthly service charge that kind of varies from uh, different, um, like you know, different platforms. But you can still expect to pay a medium percentage of each transaction. Now, when we're talking about members-only clubs, this is where it gets a little bit uh, more complicated. Again, that's things like PayPal, uh, Venmo, and Zelle. Um, these are what we're calling, you know, members-only, which means that both the seller and the purchaser or the vendor and the customer have to be members of this service. Now, if they're not members, it's okay. But uh, if your customer is not a member, that means that they will be paying, a, or they will be paying a percentage of the transaction as well. So the so in that case, you're not only fronting uh, the cost of the transaction, but your customer is it too. So it makes it a little bit more expensive for them. Um, for this reason, I think this is why a lot of um, e-commerce uh, platforms or you know, e-commerce sellers are kind of edging away from PayPal and going more to either digital wallets, credit cards, um, or payment processing options available in their website hosts. Okay. So let's just take a little bit more of a deeper dive into that. <clears throat> Um, from what we've seen in the market right now, it seems like having um, collecting payment directly from a e-commerce platform is probably the best way to go right now, simply because a growing number of hosts will actually um, process those credit card transactions for you with no monthly fee, which does save you quite a bit of money. Um, they usually offer a low to medium per transaction charge. So in this, you know, like, for example, 2.9% on each transaction plus 30 cents. Um, and it's fully integrated into your website. So they don't have to visit another website to make the purchase. They don't get distracted, um, anything like that. And the more you can keep the e-commerce uh, transactions on your website, 
the more customers feel encouraged to go around and browse and possibly buy, you know, possibly buy more. So it certainly works in your advantage as well. Okay, before we go into fulfillment or delivery considerations, are there any questions or thoughts so far? Okay, all right, so let's talk a little bit more about fulfillment and delivery. Um, now, if you're already uh, sending products, then you know that the, um, shipping can be kind of a complex operation. You have to consider how much you're sending, um, you know, what's the weight of the package, how often you ship to customers, how much they buy at one time. Um, and of course, you want to consider this when you're looking at your e-commerce system as well. So you might want to think about um, how do you intend to ship packages to your customers? Do you have a preferred carrier like the postal system or USPS? Um, or are you doing mostly local deliveries? Because that'll be different too. Um, how do you intend to charge them for shipping? How do you recoup those costs? Now, um, a very common uh, way of, 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 of managing shipping to kind of entice customers to buy more um, is to offer free shipping with a minimum order. And this is certainly very popular with customers. However, if you're doing this, it's also important to make sure that your costs elsewhere help make up for the money that you might be paying more for shipping, right? Especially if people buy uh, very big objects or heavy objects, you'll be paying more in shipping. Um, some people just charge a flat rate or they charge a percentage based on the order or it's weight-based. Um, you know, I mean, there really is no right or wrong answer. It really just depends on, you know, what you're selling and kind of, you know, what works best for you. But these are all important things to consider when you're looking at um, the, you know, at the fulfillment component of your system. Um, do you ship items typically in bulk or individually? Because that will uh, change as well. And do customers typically buy from you um, in bulk or in aggregate, or are they usually just buying one or two items at a time? Now, this is where, um, again, one of those e-commerce platforms can be very helpful because some of them offer automated carrier calculation. So you can actually calculate how much your shipping costs are going to be, which is really handy just, again, to have that all integrated into your site already, rather than having to set up a spreadsheet or do those calculations by hand. It's just another nice value add that these systems can provide. Okay. Um, so now we'll get into the second part, and this is where we're going to compare um, three major e-commerce platforms. Now, we're going to preface this by saying there are a lot of considerations to take into account when you're looking at an e-commerce platform. And of course, there are a whole plethora of these options. There's not just three. These are the three main ones. But we hope that by comparing these, uh, you'll be able to get an idea of what's best for you. So the three we're going to compare today are uh, Wix, Shopify, and GoDaddy. These ones seem to be right now the, you know, kind of the most popular e-commerce platforms. Um, we're gonna compare these based on the four categories we've discussed so far, but keep in mind that some of these platforms have many more features such as how to build your site, um, how to communicate with customers, all these things. So um, when you're looking at one of these platforms, you probably want to consider also how you're going to design your site and things like that. But for right now, we're just gonna look at the e-commerce um, or uh, we're just going to look at the e-commerce component. Okay, so let's start with general features. The nice thing about all these three is they all offer some sort of free level or trial period. And that's really helpful because it gives you a chance to set up your uh, catalog and just kind of play with it and see how easy or hard it would be for you to maintain. Um, all that without having to make any kind of uh, long-term monthly commitment. Just keep in mind that Shopify has a free trial and then they move you to um, a low introductory price, whereas Wix and GoDaddy um, both have a just a free level completely, um, but neither of those um, offer a free level that allows you to do uh, custom branding or transaction capabilities. So at that point, you're just basically setting up the catalog and seeing how it works. Um, you know, as you can see on the slide on our chart here, the price varies a lot. Uh, Shopify probably has the biggest variation, anywhere from $29 a month to $299 a month, um, which gives you a lot of flexibility if you're doing lots of different kinds of e-commerce. But just keep in mind, um, you know, like you know, these monthly costs may vary and, and, you know, I mean, it all kind of depends on how much business you're doing um, and what resources you have to commit to that. 
Um, all three do have the ability to operate under your own domain name. So your domain name uh, would be www. You know your name. Something else. So ours is um, ascendantdesign.net, um, and that just makes it easy for customers to find you. Um, and all three of these do offer some sort of shopping cart integration. Just keep in mind that with GoDaddy, um, you only get that integration if you're paying $16 a month or more. Okay, so now we'll compare the shopping cart features. And as we mentioned before, this is really an important component that will determine how easy um, and how uh, seamless your shopping experience is. Um, I would say that if you're looking at doing services, you might wanna give a good look at Wix. Um, they have a pretty robust uh, scheduling feature that allows you to uh, synchronize schedules across multiple team members who are providing services. Um, Shopify, by contrast, does not offer a bookings option. So if you're doing services, Shopify may not be your best option. Uh, if you're doing a combination, say, of products and services, you can still use Shopify. You might just have to integrate um, an additional application to make it work. Um, but GoDaddy also offers uh, basic scheduling as well. Um, another way of, or another kind of more common or popular way of, of, of accepting um, uh, payment is through some kind of subscription. And this can be either for a product or a service. Um, all our Wix and Shopify both um, provide subscriptions, but at an additional cost. GoDaddy, by contrast, does not. So if you're looking at doing some sort of uh, subscription model, GoDaddy may not be your best choice. The nice thing about all these three is that all of them have um, shopping cart integration that's very transparent. It's fully integrated into the site and it allows your customers to make purchases from any page, which is nice. Okay, let's look at uh, payment processing. Um, Wix is a good option if you are maybe operating in one of those high-risk business categories. Not only do they give you a pretty decent uh, rate in terms of what you pay per transaction, but they also have more than 80 payment gateways available for higher-risk businesses. Now, these are typically going to be um, an application that you plug into your site. Um, so on your end as the vendor, you'll have to work with that third-party integration separately to pay your fees and things like that. But from the customer side, it'll look like it's built right in. So you have that integrated uh, payment processor built into your website. Um, now, um, if you're operating um, just basically in a low-risk business, you could choose any three of these. Um, all three of them offer pretty decent um, payment per transactions from 2.9 to 2.3% of the transaction plus 30%, or excuse me, 30 cents. Um, if you know um, that your customers are using a wide range of payment options, then Shopify might be an option to look at. They offer um, all different support for different types of payment, including Apple Pay, Amazon Pay, Meta Pay, Bitcoin, Shop, you know, all those types of things. Um, by contrast, Wix only supports Apple Pay in addition to um, basic um, or major credit card transactions. Um, so if you know that your customers, you know, usually use digital wallets, Wix might be a little bit harder of a lift for you. Um, all three of these do offer PayPal support. So if you know that your customers are using that, um, all three of these would be a good option for you. Now, just to kind of circle back to Wix in terms of their payment processing, um, we know um, that they use uh, Stripe, which is a well-known um, and reputable uh, credit card processor for processing transactions. So that would be a good integration as well, again, especially if you're leaning very heavily on credit card uh, processing. Okay, and then finally, we'll look at fulfillment and delivery. Um, all three of these do offer uh, free shipping over a certain and minimum amount. Shopify, however, gives you the option to uh, do free shipping based on other criteria. So um, kind of my main takeaway just from looking at these three comparisons is that Shopify is a, probably a really robust option if you're doing a lot of shipping. Um, so you're mostly doing a products based uh, service. Um, Wix, on the other hand, um, again, it's, it's just free shipping over a certain amount. And the same thing with GoDaddy. Um, all three of them support um, 
all different types of shipping models, whether it's flat rate, weight-based, price-based, and product-based. Um, now the carrier calculation, again, that's where it can save you a lot of time because the system itself can help you identify how much you'll be paying in shipping. And again, Shopify is a much more robust option. It gives you an option to do that carrier calculation for USPS or Postal Service, uh, UPS and DHL Express. Um, GoDaddy is probably the second best option for that. They have um, carrier calculation for both Postal Service and UPS. Wix only offers it for the Postal Service. So again, if you're doing a lot of shipping, Wix might not be your first option. Shopify may be something to look at instead. Um, all three of them um, offer uh, in-person or curbside pickup. So if that's something that you're doing on a regular basis, that's a good option to have. Uh, Shopify, however, doesn't allow you to charge for that. So it's just a free service. And of course, all three offer um, you know, local delivery. So it supports that as well. Okay, uh, one more little note, and then uh, we'll head to uh, the Q&A section of today's webinar. Uh, so we've looked at three main platforms. We've looked at the four components. You might be thinking, well, is there an alternative? Yes, there is. You can definitely uh, look at creating your own website from scratch. However, this comes with some caveats. Um, you wanna keep in mind that this will require intermediate to advanced programming skills or hiring somebody who has those skills. And that can be uh, quite expensive, to be honest. Um, this option does give you full control over your entire site's functionality. However, unless you're doing something very custom, and very bespoke, it probably makes a lot more sense just to use an existing e-commerce platform rather than trying to build it yourself. Uh, if you try to build it yourself, you'll be investing a lot into programming and figuring out how things work. And honestly, it's probably just gonna be uh, more cost-effective to use an existing system. Okay, um, any questions or thoughts? I know that we've covered a lot of ground today. Uh, if you'd like me to go back and um, flip through any of some of those other comparison charts, um, if that would be helpful, please let me know. Um, or just let me know whatever the questions you might have today. While you're thinking about that, um, here's another question for you. Um, if you're using an e-commerce platform right now, which one are you using and would you, um, and would you recommend it? Okay, um, so back to the first question. Uh, Selena has a question on, do you have any perspectives or experience with Square? And this would probably be a good question for Daniel. Uh, no, I I don't have any direct experience with Square that would be uh, timely. <laughs> the last time I looked at them was maybe about five years ago. Yeah, okay. Um, how about anybody else in the webinar today? Uh, has anybody else um, had experience with Square and would you recommend it and why or why not? It might be helpful. Okay. Roberta said that uh, they'll be using both Shopify and Etsy. Okay, excellent, excellent. Yeah, I've 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 not worked with Etsy myself, but I've heard good reviews from people who have. Um, Roberta, um, what's been you, uh, what's been your experience so far with Shopify? Are you happy with it, or um, are you looking at other options right now? We also have. Okay, I haven't started using it yet. Okay. We also have another question in the chat um, related to specific platforms that work best for fundraising in a nonprofit. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, what do you think, Daniel? Well, um, <clears throat> oddly enough, uh, I think, well, it, it really depends on. Uh, how you want to be raising funds if if you're just taking donations um i think that it seems like uh, you know a lot of the digital wallets and paypal seem to be the best place to receive donations and things like that but then there are a lot of 
a sort of like GoFundMe type of sites out there who actually provide their own uh, payment processing. So if, if you have a, a profile on one of those types of sites, then your payment processing would be taken care of for you. So, um, okay. So Emma says that uh, we're looking to sell t-shirts, et cetera, branded with our logo. And, and that probably has something to do with fundraising in a nonprofit as well. So um, in that case, uh, Emma, or, uh, could you specify whether you would be uh, more like uh, sending a T-shirt in exchange for a donation of a certain level or something like that? Sort of like donate $10 and get a free T-shirt type of situation or? No, not, not necessarily. We would be um, using a drop shipping company and they would be purchasing the gear, whatever it is, you know, thermoses, mugs or sweatshirts or whatever directly from them and that company would be drop shipping it directly to the client and they would okay. be purchasing it for a specific price okay so that was a direct purchase then and and then you're also looking at doing a nonprofit fundraising as uh, one of yeah your... in that yeah in in that way okay yeah um i i'd say in order to uh, work out your best answer um you'd really have to experiment and find <laughs> the one that would work and maybe find the one that wouldn't work. Um, I don't have any direct uh, experience with that recently. Um, we did have a nonprofit organization several years ago, but um, so many things are improved vastly just over the past couple of years in, in their uh, the way that they all work. Um, there might be some information available just through searching uh, to tell you the truth. Um, I would add to Emma, um, you know, I mean, I mean, obviously, I mean, like, you know, we're not a nonprofit, but just 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 from a perspective of kind of general user perspective, um, we've been using Wix, re Wix recently, and that's pretty robust, um, even for a small monthly uh, fee or relatively small. Um, I do know that there's an integration where you can add uh, PayPal uh, buttons throughout your site, including ones I believe that are branded specifically to donate now, uh, which is really great. For instance, if you're running a specific campaign or if you have a certain cause, you can definitely attach those to those posts or uh, sites. Um, so I would say, yeah, I mean, definitely kind of search around, but I would uh, recommend me, you know, maybe looking at Wix as your first option. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay. So I see uh, in the chat, uh, Sherry says uh, Square will process transactions on and offline, which can be helpful. Yes, I've heard about that. That's, yeah, that's definitely helpful if you have kind of a hybrid model where you're both online and offline. Uh, we sell at trade shows and sometimes we don't have cell service. Yeah, that's a really good consideration too. It's kind of like where you're, like, you know, where you're selling. Um, and again, whether or not you have a, you know, whether or not you have a hybrid model, if you're totally online, if you do some of your uh, transactions offline, um, I have heard good things about Square, especially with the credit card um, option too. So that might be something you consider as well. Um, okay, uh, Cindy says issues with Square is that it is not good for large one-time purchases. Etsy is something we were considering moving away from the auction platform for some of our collections. Okay, okay, so that's good to know too that Square um, may not be your best option if you do a lot of one-time, large one-time purchases. Okay, uh, let's see, Nicole mentions uh, Classy as a good nonprofit solution. Um, I haven't heard of that. Um, Nicole, would you mind uh, dropping more information either in the chat or by unmuting your microphone if you're comfortable with that? kind of underscores that there are lots of different uh, e-commerce platforms out there. Um, and it's always good to kind of have all the different leads on uh, different ones that might work for you. Okay, so Nicole shared a link outdoorsforall.org. Okay, um, is this your website, Nicole? Okay, sorry, Classy hosts the giving page, okay. Okay, so yeah, so yeah, if you click on that link, um, there's a main 
page at the top called giving and that uh, looks like they host that page. Nicole, do you mind if we share that to everyone? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if I can just share my screen and share that real quick, because that might be helpful to see. And let's see here. Okay, so you should be able to see my browser window now. Um, and I have it open to the website, uh, Outdoors for All, and I'm on the giving page. Uh, yeah, and as you can see, there's, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it's integrated straight into the site, the make a donation today. Uh, if you click donate. Nice. Okay, yeah, it takes you straight to a form where you can uh, set up your donation. That's great. Cool. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, I'll switch back to the uh, slide deck. Okay, any other thoughts or resources or questions you want to share today? Oops. All right. Well, seeing none, I think that that will conclude our webinar for today. I'd like to thank everyone for being here with us today, especially Bridget and Daniel, and for sharing all of your valuable information with us. We really appreciate it. Um, and I would also like to remind everyone that we will be having another webinar on Thursday, March 16th at 11 a.m. We're going to cover collecting payment in person and online. And so that might answer some further questions that we have as well. So once again, thank you. And be sure to check out wyomingcommunitynavigator.org for our calendar of events with all of our upcoming events as well. So thank you, everyone, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you.